So what I'm going to say here is my talk is going to be very simple minded and actually naive, not philosophically deep, but I hope it'll be um, interesting for you. So we can start with this uh, quote, which you're, I'm sure, familiar with by Louis de Broglie. Um, this idea that surfaced very early, I think even before the, the uh, wave function uh, codification in 1926, the notion that quantum phenomena are somehow related to the interaction of particles, for example, with some sort of a medium or some kind of field, um, which de Broglie called a thermostat, energetic interaction. Now, I want to uh, focus on a very, very simple one-dimensional kind of a model. It's really a way of thinking as a, um, um, and just focus on the issue of so-called quantization, which was one of the starting points of quantum theory, of course, the quantized energy levels of atoms. Now, we're starting now from so-called classical physics, or just physics, um, but from a very concrete standpoint, where can you get something uh, which you know about, you can get your hands on, which suggests this phenomenon of quantization? Well, uh, now we have lots of examples. It was not so easy in the 1926. Now we know a lot of nonlinear systems. We have very good numerical methods and so on. So we have lots of systems which display multi-stability. They have a discrete um, array of stable or quasi-stable modes. So there are a lot of systems like this. Now, the question is, if we want to take that as a starting point, multi-stability as a starting point for thinking about quantization, well, there are a lot of these systems. So we would want to somehow narrow things down to find look for something really that we could call fundamental or universal. So this is where the Dubushitsky pendulum comes in as a kind of paradigm, as a very simple example of a uh, classical uh, system, a system uh, is easy to build, uh, which displays uh, quantization in the, in the sense that I uh, stated. Um, it's a pendulum, an ordinary pendulum with a magnet, permanent magnet on the end. And at the low point of its swing, there's an electromagnet, which is fed by a alternating current. He generally just uses 50 Hertz, but it could be also a thousand. And it displays a discrete set of stable amplitudes, stable modes of oscillation. And in between, they're not stable. So if you start with the pendulum somewhere, you release it, it will either fall into one of these modes or it will decay to just some vibration in the, in the, the proximity of the magnet. We could call that the ground state. So it's a, it's a wonderful thing uh, to, to play with. Um, and I will just tell you, if you don't believe this phenomenon, build one yourself. It's even being done now in Russia, for example, for school classes or high school classes as a very good project. So, and this is Daniel Dubushinsky, the discoverer of, um, of this actually as a model for a much broader uh, uh, category of systems, which he and his brother Yakov began to discover starting 1968. So now I'm going to play or try to play for you a video, very short one. Now pay attention. You'll first see Daniel demonstrating the first excited state, if you allow me to call it that, of the pendulum. And then he'll sh I'll show another one. He'll show another one and then a third. The four if you look closely, you will see that these states are not completely stationary. They are constant fluctuations which I'll mention, I'll talk about a bit later. And then the last example that he gives, uh, you actually see the pendulum decaying in the direction of the, of the ground state. It, unfortunately, the, the video cuts before it, the whole story is over. It catches a bad phase and gets um, slowed down. 
So here we go. And then after Dubashinsky, you will see uh, just a short uh, passage from a, a video from a Russian uh, group, uh, actually in this case, a, a pedagogical group in the competition for young physics students. And then after that, you'll see one another demonstration, which is very entertaining, um, which I think you'll understand by Dubashinsky. So here we go. So you see the electromagnet below, and it's uh, maintained by drawing energy from the electromagnet to compensate the, the dissipation of the pendulum. You can see slight variations in the amplitude. There you see the it's very narrow kind of zone of interaction. Now you see a large amplitude, but you can see the amplitude is changing. Yeah. Oh, no, that's the one. Here's the one where you can see it decaying. Now you see it oscillating between two states temporarily, and it will catch a bad phase. Oh, there it goes. OK. Here you see a phase diagram and the explanation. I don't know if you can hear it. Um, very simple one to make. You can see it's the right phase diagram. Here it's noted by the teacher that the uh, frequency is slightly slower for the large amplitudes. And now you now you see the multi pendulum of Dubushinsky, three pendulums each, each oscillating at near its own proper frequency, feeding on one and the same high frequency field. With a little bit of, there you go. And each of those has uh, a, its own proper frequencies. Each of these has um, each of the three, but it could be also as many as you want, pendulum of different lengths, each operating at near its proper frequency in one or the other of its own quantized amplitudes. So now I want to just say a few words about the phenomenology, what you find when you play with this system. Um, I already mentioned the discrete series of stable modes uh, in which the dissipation of the pendulum is compensated by, you might say, packets of energy absorbed from the source, little pushes from the magnetic field. Of course, accompanied also by, depending on the on the um, on the phase, by also moments of of, of uh, deceleration. In each mode, as I said, you're near the natural frequency. It is observed that the quantized amplitudes are virtually independent of the strength of the field, that is, of the current supplied to the electromagnet. For very large fields, the pendulum get transfers a tra transits to a chaotic regime. Um, very interestingly, the amplitudes are virtually, for small values of dissipation, uh, don't change much, almost not at all, when the dissipation is changed. I'll get back to that. However, the, the, the amplitudes depend very sensitively on the frequency. Higher frequency, more quantized states. And experiments done by Dubushinsky went up to many thousands of hertz for a pendulum uh, with a period of one second. Um, it's interesting, there are many forms of this. Uh, the, the exact shape uh, or of the electromagnet, the, the, the shape of the, cur the current, the various aspects of the system can be changed without um, uh, changing very much the the quantized amplitudes without uh, while maintaining the, the phenomena. Um, so what else? Yes, if you start the pendulum from some initial condition, you observe that um, a kind of stochastic uh, variation for very small differences in the exact moment when you release the pendulum, uh, where you release it from, but above all the phase of the alternating current at the moment, you release the pendulum. The pendulum will go into one or the other of the um, of the of the uh, stable amplitudes. So, and the last point, as I said, that you have uh, you can feed 
a lot of these systems on one and the same source. So this would be thermostat analogous to the to Du Bois thermostat. So as I said, this is just an example. It's just a very example that's very easy to build that illustrates uh, a, a, a much more general principle uh, class of nonlinear systems involving the interaction or a coupling of oscillators of differing frequencies, sometimes differing by orders of magnitude, uh, and each one operating near to its proper frequency. So they, the interaction does not change the frequencies of the oscillators very much. Dubushinsky and I taught, like to have the idea that these oscillators are sort of independent. They, they maintain their sovereignty. They maintain a certain independence while interacting with each other. And these systems then display uh, a wide, wide uh, uh, family of these systems display this same type of behavior as the pendulum. So there was in the uh, 1970s and 1980s, uh, the Dubushinsky, uh, Daniel and Jakob uh, did extensive studies of the pendulum, but also of a lot of other systems. Um, also looking for technological applications, which I won't talk about here, dozens of pub uh, publications, um, uh, nearly all in Russian language and with a group of groups of collaborators. They also built some remarkable uh, wild kind of things, such as putting uh, uh, electric oscillating systems on floating platforms where they could interact with coils that they were mounted. They could interact and move around um, relative to each other. So there's a lot of phenomena that they studied extensively. Dubushinsky has a monograph um, on that. Unfortunately, it's in Russian. Uh, I did a series of articles with him uh, start in, uh, starting around 2000, really reflecting on possible implications of this phenomenon. Uh, it recently, in the, the recent years, particularly the last 10 years, there's been more and more interest in the pendulum, especially with much more careful studies with, with you know, uh, state-of-the-art methods um, in China and Russia and in France. And the, the, the pendulum has become a very, uh, a, a pretty uh, popular demonstration experiment that can get people, young students can build and, and, and study. You can find a bibliography. I can also send it to anybody who wants to get the, the link uh, in a short, relatively short summary in English uh, by Dubushinsky, which has a long, uh, relatively long bibliography. So, uh, now, just very briefly, looking, looking a bit on, on the theory, let's say mathematical study, as is typical with nonlinear systems, um, the mathematics quickly gets, uh, I wouldn't say hopeless, but very, very complicated uh, and requires all the art of the, the practitioners of this art of uh, of, of modeling nonlinear systems. So we see above here a general uh, equation, important here, the left side, you have an equation of a nonlinear single dimensional oscillator. On the right side, you have a forcing function, but the important thing is that the forcing function depends on the argument of the system. And usually the most interesting is when you can't separate them. It's not a parametric, oscillation, as it's called, uh, is when F has them intertwined. So I won't go more. So it, it, nonlinearity is important for getting an amplitude frequency dependence, which is key to the quantization of the amplitudes. In the Dubushinsky pendulum, uh, this is now a very simplified uh, simplification. You have here your feeding, your, your field, uh, sinusoidal uh, function. There's uh, big omega is the, the frequency, say 50 hertz or maybe a thousand hertz. And this epsilon of x is a step function, which is zero outside a very narrow range and one inside. 
So what you have is you have this signal sign of omega t inside, or the force, inside this so-called interaction zone, and zero outside. Outside, the pendulum is free to oscillate, uh, you know, to do its own thing. There's another type, which is extremely interesting, but very difficult or uh, nearly impossible to simulate with, a, in a, with an experimental system, which is where you have an interaction which is not limited to a small area, but where you have a wave uh, interacting with the system. Here you have, for example, a charge interacting with electromagnetic wave, the charge being attached to a nonlinear or, or nonlinear uh, system. Here you see um, uh, a diagram to the below schematic. And these also have discrete sets of uh, quantized amplitudes. Very interesting if you go back historically to Planck himself and his uh, study of elementary oscillators interacting with a uh, with an electromagnetic field. Now, very briefly, where do these discrete amplitudes come from? Well, just very heuristically, very simple-mindedly, we take here the equation for Dubashinsky's pendulum, and now we assume that we have a motion which is periodic with this frequency near to the proper frequency. Um, and now we look at the epsilon of x. Now this is going to be periodic with period small omega. So we can resolve it into a Fourier series and multiply by the, um, by the field term. And by trigonometry, we get a sim simply what you also have when you modulate a um, a frequency and amplitude modulation uh, by, by a sine wave freak, uh, signal, you get an array of, um, of, of frequency components. Um, and now comes the interesting point. If the frequency of the field is a integral multiple of the frequency of the oscillator at this moment, say the, the pendulum, then you have here among the frequencies in the spectrum, one which agrees, which has exactly the frequency of the system. So you have a, a resonant component. So the, the, the pendulum acting, you could say the system acting upon the source that it's feeding upon brings forth, you would say, a frequency component that agrees with its frequency. And that's uh, gives the possibility for sustained oscillations. Now, if we look at it, now we look at the frequency amplitude dependency. Now we're thinking of the small omega as being a variable. And we're asking you know, for which omegas can this happen? Then you see here approximately the dependency on amplitudes. Um, so you get, you get a forcing component, the possibility of resonant forcing. If, uh, if big omega is an integral multiple of small omega, the, the, the frequency of the system, uh, in other words, if small omega is a subharmonic. So you're looking at the subharmonics of the, of the field frequency and which subharmonics fall into the range of, of frequencies of your pendulum. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a function of the amplitude. In fact, then you get, you can calculate then for what amplitudes the resulting frequency, the frequency decreases, the period increases with the amplitude of the pendulum, for what amplitudes do you get uh, frequencies of oscillation of the pendulum, which are subharmonics of the field frequency. So this is, in a nutshell, the source of of the, uh, of the quantized, amp quantized amplitudes, you can calculate them. But I haven't said anything about the energy balance. I haven't said anything about dissipation. I haven't said anything about where the stability comes from. I mean, this is essentially the scheme that I just described to you. Um, are these attractors? Well, experiments and numerical simulations confirm, in fact, the existence of these modes. The theory gives approximately fairly correct uh, values, the simple-minded calculation I mentioned. But you don't really get a proof that these uh, 
These modes are stable. In fact, they're quasi-stable. Sometimes, if you're out lucky, at a certain point, a stable energy state will, will decay. So the trouble is you have this relationship, amplitude, phase, dip, change, fluctuation, amplitude changes the phase. The change in phase changes the, the portion of energy uh, fed into the system or removed from the system and so on. I don't want to get into, for time reasons, into details. You also have uh, acceleration of the pendulum inside the, uh, the interaction zone, which introduces a symmetry breaking. OK, you have a series of passages through the interaction zone where you have a change in amplitude and a change of phase. So you can iterate, you can express this mathematically, the transformation from one oscillation to the next, you take usually ha uh, a half oscillation, the, uh, an entry, either one direction, or the other direction. So you can iterate this and look at what happens in the phase uh, space. And you find that the result of the process depends very sensitively on the, uh, on the initial conditions. Here you see two examples. This is a um, actual measurement of a pendulum uh, from China. Here you see it released at 80 degrees and it, it uh, goes into a mode. And here you release it almost the same but a different uh, phase and it decays to the ground state. Here you see the example of what I mentioned of uh, when the, when the uh, amplitude of the field, the strength of the field is very large, you get this chaotic behavior. Here you see, this is now a numerical simulation done by Shumayev and Maitzelis in Ukraine, where you see um, a, a some, a, an envelope function. What's generally done in the mathematical study of these systems is an averaging process. You average the phase, you assume that the phase and amplitude are relatively slowly changing, which is not strictly speaking true, but you assume it and you get uh, an approximation uh, which Shumayev calls an envelope function. And here you see the envelope function and the simulated behavior of the system. They don't agree exactly, but the fit is not too bad. Now, very interestingly, I won't write down now the, the, the envelope function that they uh, worked out, but here you see a phase diagram um, here you see the, the amplitude here, phase, um, showing the basins of three of the uh, stable amplitudes. Now you notice, well, we could talk about this a lot. These white areas are uh, initial conditions which eventually collapse to the, the ground state. So you have them all over the place, right? Here is... Um, Here's an actual results of, of rather painstaking numerical simulation to get uh, where you start out at different points and you see where they end. And you see more, more or less uh, uh, agreement, qualitatively at least. Now here, very interesting uh, thing. This is rel relative new work, 2017. Using the envelope function, uh, you can try to predict the probability that you'll end up in one or the other of these three uh, amplitudes, the three attractors, starting from a given energy level. In other words, a given amplitude, a, a given position when you release the, the pendulum. And you see there are areas, uh, points, heights of the pendulum when you release it, where you could go into uh, any of the three amplitudes. And the probabilities are never 100%. So at any, any place you start the pendulum, you could go into the ground state. So uh, Shumayev called this, um, made and, and uh, Mizellus compared this envelope function with, uh, with the statistical quantum wave in the Born sense, um, giving the statistical distribution of what quantum um, state you will end up with uh, for an arbitrary phase uh, when you release the pendulum.
Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but you should try and to wrap it up because there, if you want to have some questions. Yes, yes. Well, I'm nearly finished. Okay, Great. I mentioned the, the argumental Planck oscillator. Um, uh, and I refer, I already said what I wanted to say basically about it. So here's just the finish. Um, I mean, I see an anal uh, analogy with the with Cooter's bouncer and Walker, and the the I with uh, 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 feeding and walking on a oscillating uh, surface. Um, and here, in the case of the memory of the pendulum, we have one dimensional system, but you one can generalize that, and the Dubushinskys did that to a certain extent. I think you're in the, you're in a somewhat similar area. Um, so, uh, one moral of, this, of the story, you might say, is with these types of interactions, you could have, theoretically, as a wild idea, you could have a, 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 a sub-quantum medium, which is approximately monochromatic, which would be supporting the existence of all kinds of objects, different kinds of particles, different energy states, and so forth. And being fed in that way, these systems would also naturally form quantized energy states. Stochastic behavior is part of that. We observe that with the experiments. A very interesting point is um, that experiments and numerical simulations carried out by the Duboshinskys uh, indicate that this sort of phenomenon occurs with dissipation zero. Dissipate, these are not really dissipative structures in the sense of Prigogine, but you more as a give and take. And there you get, of course, to the point that uh, in the Dubochinsky pendulum, pendulum, we didn't look at what the pendulum does to the field. Whereas, of course, in the, in the Walker case, the field is being modified and you get a wave there. But uh, here the key is not dissipation. It's more the give and take uh, between two oscillating systems that are coupled nonlinearly. So the question is, if you uh, generalize this kind of notion of interaction and use the pendulum as a kind of, of, uh, of uh, paradigm, could this give you some ideas about how to think about microphysical phenomena in general? Thank you. <laughs>